This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Facebook Design. One thing that I love asking guests on the show is what advice they would give to an up-and-coming designer. When I talked with Carla Cole, a product designer at Facebook, here's what she told me. The best advice that I have been given about design is to focus on what you are doing and kill it. Learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. Are you looking for a job? Do you know someone who's looking for a job? Then check out our job board over at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. Whether you want a full-time job or you're looking for something temporary or freelance, we've got you covered. This week, Syracuse University is looking for a web analytics architect. Mapbox is looking for a front-end engineer. Vox Media is looking for a platform design director. Jopwell is looking for a lead designer. And here at Revision Path, we're looking for design writers as well as a brand marketing strategist. We also have job listings from Indeed.com, so head to the Revision Path job board at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to apply and to search for any other listings. Don't forget to sign up for weekly job alerts, and when there are new positions added to the job board, you'll get an email so you can be the first to apply. And if you're looking for more jobs, then become a member of our Slack community and join the jobs channel. See you there. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, it's the last week for our audience survey. So, you know, we've grown a lot over the past year and we conduct this audience survey, you know, to learn more about you and about what you think about the show. So head on over to revisionpath.com forward slash survey to take it. Should take you about five to 10 minutes to complete it. Plus, everyone who submits the survey will be entered into a giveaway for a $100 Amazon.com gift card. Again, that's revisionpath.com forward slash survey. The survey ends on May the 1st. Now let's talk about our sponsors, MailChimp, Hover, and SiteGround. Join more than 15 million people who use MailChimp to not only send emails, but to grow their businesses on their own terms. Start sending professional-looking newsletters to your clients today for absolutely free. MailChimp. Send better email. When you have a great idea for a project, you need to give it a great domain name. And guess what? Finding that perfect domain name is super easy with Hover. You know what else Hover makes super easy? Setting up that new domain with the most popular website builders out there. They have this feature called Hover Connect, and you can use that to set up your domain automatically in just a few clicks with Tumblr, Squarespace, etc. No more digging through help articles to figure out how to get your domain working. Go to hover.com forward slash revision path and get 10% off your first purchase. Again, that's hover.com forward slash revision path. Hover, domain names for your ideas. SiteGround's hosting services are crafted for professional, business, or enterprise projects. So whether you're building something custom or you're using a CMS like WordPress, SiteGround lets you build better, faster, safer websites more easily, and they offer multiple hosting options that your websites can grow into. And we've got a fantastic deal for you. Visit SiteGround.com forward slash revision path to get 60% off on all hosting plans. 60%. Now for this week's interview. We're back in the UK and we're talking with London-based designer and entrepreneur Brian Hollingsworth. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Brian Hollingsworth, currently situated in UK, London. I just call myself a designer, which covers print and digital, mostly digital. So I'm like 70, 30 digital to print. Okay. Done a bit of UI but I can't, I wouldn't put it on my CV. I wouldn't boast about it, even though I <laughs> can't have put it on my CV, but yeah. <laughs> now, you have the distinction of being the first international interview that I've done for Revision Path. For those that are listening, when I started back in 2013 and I was reaching out to people, pretty much everyone was just here in the States. And Brian, you were the first person that I reached out to in the UK, and we have a text-based interview. There'll be a link in the show notes so people can 
can go and read that. But yeah, that was back in in, uh, in 2014. And since then, you know, I've had quite a few folks on Revision Path that are in yeah. Europe, in London specifically, John Daniel, Gabrielle Smith, Kojo Boateng, Marsha Mothersill, and most recently, just a few weeks ago, Alex Fafega. How would you describe London's design scene for black designers there? Oh, man. I remember I had this question last time. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, it's funny enough because the answer is kind of this, the same, but not quite the same. So since that time, I remember I think I said I, I didn't really kind of get out much and I was just kind of a bit of a recluse, you know, as most creatives are. You're just in your room and you don't really know anybody, except if you go to uni or college or you have friends in the area or blah, blah, blah. I think it was last year I had a, f- a friend she went to uni with this girl and she started up a company called Better Shared and uh, it's just a platform to promote I think it might be African artists black artists anyone that's any creative person that's of a you know black descent or whatever mm-hmm. and she invited me to this actually I saw it on the internet and then she, she had like a meet up so then when I went there I've never seen so much black creative people in my life not in one place because I went to uni in uh, London College of Communication okay. and there was like 200 students there was about five black people wow so you knew who was who and who was missing and who was late because you have that black guy that black girl that black guy right not to really make it about a race thing but yeah so when i went it was really amazing actually i met a few people a few people that i kind of already knew guy that i went to school with i'm um, uni actually sorry but yeah just exchanged a few instagram accounts just and just it was a great kind of event to connect so it just kind of got me thinking like, wow, there's all these people out here and I don't even know them, but we're all sitting in, in the same backyard, so to speak. Mm-hmm. There's not one kind of place where we all kind of commune and connect and, and kind of share, which is a bit of a shame. I mean, some people knew some people, but I guess when you go to those kind of events, you kind of stick to who you know, and it's a bit kind of hard to be like, hey, what do you do? Which was, that's what I was doing most of the time with other people. Like, hey, and people come up to me like, what do you do? I'm like, hey, I do this. And they're like, oh, okay, that's cool. Let me see your stuff. And then you're just looking at someone's Instagram or Twitter or their website as you're, as you're talking to them and they're talking about up and coming projects, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. So then that kind of edges me on to kind of like, wow, there's some people out there. Maybe I should try and search for them and try and connect. So I had a Twitter, but I never really spoke on it. I did a couple of retweets, just read a couple of news. But then I think for the past six to eight months, I would say I've been kind of trying to get into conversations and get in there with anyone that kind of pops up on my feed or anyone that gets retweeted or whatever, just have an interest in conversations really, to be honest. Yeah. yeah so I can't, I can't boast. I can't even boast even a thousand followers, but I'm building it slowly. Well, you got, I mean, everyone's got to start somewhere. So I wouldn't, don't try to oh, focus on the numbers, you know, <laughs> so oh, no, 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 never, that. never that. Well, I mean, I've seen some of the, I mean, there are some videos that you put out through your, uh, I guess your studio Hollingsworth and videos about yeah. like, yeah. you know, creativity and things like that. So that's kind of a start, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. To be honest, with that, that's a, that's a long, that's a his, there's a historical story behind the studio. I'm sure we've got time. So, uh, hey, we're on a podcast. We got nothing but time. So why don't you tell us about it? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's it. So uh, what was it? I've just celebrated a year in official business. So I've been designing since I was 16. Well, I found Photoshop when I was 16. So I, I just call that the point of when I started designing. To give away my age, is just a over 10 years so I've been having clients but I've never officially <laughs> had a business yeah so I've technically been designing for about 10 years worked in a couple places a couple internships I think my biggest break was when I worked with TFL and that's when I kind of thought like wow you know big company big money like I've really kind of you know I'm really doing this design thing I'm making it prior to that it was just a couple of startups friends families referrals here and there work, nothing really recurring. But they were really good projects. Obviously, it was they were good enough to get TFO interested. So, and now yeah, for those at, that are for those that are listening, though, what is TFO? Sorry, Transport for London. It's, okay, they they control all the transport in London, so they control the roads, they control trains, buses, cabs. Yeah, every transport. Yeah, they, that is big. They, they kind of yeah, so they own it. But different companies work with them, so they own the route, the bus routes, but different companies have owned the buses. So you can have like three different bus companies, like let's say Mercedes, Ford, and let's say Cadillac, since we're talking to Americans, would have three different types of bus 
factors, but TFL it was the roots and they own all the train lines. I'm not sure how it works in America, but that's one. Obviously, America is way bigger than London, but one company, which is a government company, owns all of that. So the government owns it, basically. Okay. It's not really communism, but yeah. <laughs> 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 sounds like sounds like it but so yeah so that was my one of my first digital experiences actually because they were recruiting for to do their one of their apps actually and their online stuff so I got recruited as a visual designer it was a simple simple process where I just applied and went for an interview and then the manager liked me and then I got the job but yeah it was it was a good one because I did what well, I'll say one major project, which was the Santander Cycles app. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have Santander where you guys are. I'm sure they're global, but I've never been to America, so I wouldn't know. Well, um, what, are, what are they? They're a bank. They're a very big bank. Okay. Yeah, they're a big bank down here. So what happens is that they we've got these cycles where you can, they're owned by the CETFL, but you can rent them out. Mm-hmm. Kind of like Amsterdam, where it's everybody cycling. So they try to like do this whole Amsterdamified city and you could just kind of put your money on or put your card in and you could just take a bike out for a couple of hours or a day or even a week or a year and you just put it back in the dock, which are just situated in different places around the city. So basically they had a, a previous sponsor, which was Barclays, which is another bank. So they pay like 56 million every six years or whatever for, the, for a six year contract. So that contract was up. So then Santander, another bank was taking on the contract. So... They had to, I had to design the app basically. So the app was formerly blue, which was Barclays, had to kind of turn red to Santander. Mm-hmm. But when we when we got the app, it was the UX was just a total mess. So even though it was like fixing up the UI, there wasn't much we could actually do because it was pretty locked down. So it kind of just turned out to turn everything red with a little bit of UX and a little bit of UI changes. But they threw me that and I kind of worked on it for about two weeks and did the whole um, rebranding so to speak, and inverted commas on that. And then in my downtime, I worked, because TFL doesn't actually do any apps. This is like an outright thing that they said, we do not do apps full stop. But because it's a, because it's a government, but it's owned by the government, but it's... It's like a public resource. Yeah. So then their data, i.e. on the roads, buses, bus times, train times, is open source data. So anyone can use it. So there's this app, called City Mapper, and they're just like the best travel app around where you can get train times, bus times, routes, journeys, whatever you need, the price from here to there, blah, 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 times, all of that. So they use the, the data from TFL that TFL themselves do not use for an app. They use it. They've got their own online sort of apps, but they don't have a phone app. So they use that, and they've kind of cornered the market for that kind of travel app market. If you're in London, you, you definitely know about it. So... This was partly owned by TFL, partly owned by Santander because we're using Santander's brand name, but the bikes are owned by TFL and it's a TFL initiative. So it was, there was a little bit of politics, like kind of who owns the, the app kind of thing because TFL said they don't do apps for a reason I do not know because it's 2017 now and they still don't do apps. So this doesn't really make sense. But hey, what are you going to do? So yeah, so I, I did a project where I did like a journey planner app because they have this journey planner function on their website where you can you type where you are and where you want to go and it gives you the best route with a train, bike, you're walking, if you're flying, if you're rolling, if you're doing anything and it gives you the best, fastest route and the best time. So I kind of just took all of that and just threw it into an app, which is on my portfolio. But yeah, and I was there for like nine months which was it was it was an all right experience, but when you work for such a very very it was a very large organization, mm-hmm. work is very slow because the work comes from all the way at the top and it has to come all the way down to you. So technically, there you don't you don't get to start a project unless it's minimum budget of thirty k. So then then you got the, then you got people who are pitching the projects, but it has to go through so many channels before it comes back to you and then goes back up again and then comes back down to you. And then you find yourself not really working on anything. So a lot of time I was just sitting there, either working on that project, that self-initiated project, or just collecting dust, or just thinking about my own stuff, or just talking to the guy next to me. Well, you know, I was was going to ask you, we'll kind of take, I guess you could say a little bit of a break, only because I feel like you're you're running a lot of stuff together really fast. Like give yourself time to to pause between stuff. What did you learn from that process, like building that app? What did you learn from all of that? I learned how I think that you kind of have to 
see from the user standpoint because when I was building the app, I realized that uh, a lot of things in life are very form heavy. So we're filling out a lot of forms, whether it's you're signing up for something or you're filling out a physical paper form or leaving a comment or whatever you're signing in and everything seems to be a form, 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 type this, type that, type that. So I, I built the app initially and I kind of just put everything on the one page and I was like, this just looks, it looks very daunting and doesn't look, if I entered this app, I would immediately exit and go into another app. So what I did was I literally slimmed everything down and trimmed it to its very simplest form I could have thought of. And so basically as soon as you would enter the app, there would be like a one, one input box that would say, where are you? Or where do you want to go from? And then you fill that in and then you just slide to the, to the right. And then it would say, where are you going to? So, and then you slide to the right again and then you would pick your transport modes and then slide to the right and then you would get some results and then you can expand on those results. But the thing I wanted to make it was like a, a very simple experience that, you know, anyone could have done. Not, a child could have done it or a granny could have done it, as they say, that it wasn't that you just entered the app and it was a very daunting kind of thing. So it taught me simplicity and kind of to, to think more about, okay, if I was using this app, how would I, which is, I wouldn't say I've done that before because with design, it's a bit different because sometimes when you're doing logos or doing books, it's a different kind of experience when some, than when someone's opening an app and has to fill out a form and has to do an action. So if, if I'm designing a t-shirt, you know, there's no action involved. You just, someone's just wearing it because it's nice. Or right. if I'm designing a, a book layout, yeah, there's a bit of action involved, but <laughs> it's not that heavily like, oh, press here or you know, turn there. So I had to kind of think, okay, what do I need this person to do? How do I galvanize this person through this app, basically? Mm -hmm. So it kind of helped me to kind of think, okay, how do I force someone to do something I want them to do kind of thing? Well, moving yeah. forward a little bit, I mean, you know, and I'm still kind of focusing on on Hollingsworth and what kind of projects and things are you working on now? Can you talk about any of that? Yeah, currently I work on a lot of my own stuff, if I'm honest. So like I said, it's only a year old officially. So proposal-wise, I've been meaning to shoot a few, a few proposals out, but because it's only me and I keep getting work in, the proposals kind of take a back seat because I don't have time to kind of finish them. I heard you talking on uh, the, the podcast you did with Alex, the system that you use for your podcast, and I, was, I don't think I caught what program it was, but I think I'll listen back to it again and see what it was because oh, well, they, they, take, my, uh, they take you a while. Yeah. Oh, I use a I use a program called Nusi. It's N U S I I, and, and there's okay. a lot of different I mean proposal building type of uh, softwares out there. There's Bid Sketch, there's Quote Roller, you know stuff like that. But what they all essentially do is they take the proposal process and they kind of systematize it by breaking down your proposal into these blocks, like these reusable blocks that you can use for every proposal moving forward. You just kind of assemble the blocks for the proposal. You make a few changes for the client name and maybe pricing or something like that. And it makes it easier to get the proposals out the door because your standard language is mostly the same, like about yeah. your studio and this is my process and these are the terms. Like that stuff is mostly going to stay the same from proposal to proposal. The only thing that's really going to change is the scope of the project and the name of the client. And so you spend the time on that, and then the other stuff is just like a, it's like building a template essentially. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So the proposal front, I don't really do much of those. I'm trying to get to that, but like I said, because it's only me essentially working here, you, get, you know, time <laughs> you don't get much of it. But yeah, projects I'm working on. Recently linked up with a friend, and I worked on her branding for she does like you know when you go to parties and you have those i don't know what to call it but you go to parties and you have those tables and they have treats and cakes and um favors and like could, could be for a birthday or a proposal mm -hmm. and this is called party treats party favors she does all of that it's an old friend and i saw her stuff online on facebook actually and it was just awful and i was just like i gotta i gotta do something i gotta help her so the one day i just um did a logo and i i, I think i instagram dm'd and i was like what do you think of this she was like, oh, I love it, da, 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 blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you can have it. And then she's like, oh, do you know, do you do other stuff like flyers? I'm like, of course. So I, now we're now working on business cards, flyers, and all of the rest. Apart from that, another friend that I, I work for, she gets me a lot of referrals as well. She's got, she's a YouTuber or a vlogger. Uh, she's got a YouTube channel, which is called Neve's Journey. And she travels the world and goes to carnivals and she has locks. And she does travel locks, 
videos on locks, videos about life, and uh, motivational videos, basically. So that's an ongoing thing, obviously, because she's on YouTube. She's always putting out videos. So that's an ongoing thing that I'm forever working on, which is amazing because I've gotten a lot of referrals from her. And it's, it's, an, it's teaching me a lot about brand building as well, especially for YouTube, which I recently just became a part of that sphere. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of teaching me a lot about branding and so on and so forth. Yeah, you said you're working on, on your own projects. I know you mentioned kind of the things that you're doing, you know, for your yeah. friends, but what's your stuff that you're working on? <laughs> okay. Here's my thought about, you know, working on stuff for myself. Because I am a brand builder, I like I like to think of myself as a brand builder and, you know, working with brands. I always think that creatives are always working with brands, but they're never really building their own. So, you know, oh, I've worked with Nike. Oh, I've worked with, you know, this startup and that startup. But then we don't manage our own brands. So, for instance, you know, I've worked with, let's say I've worked with a hot pepper sauce company and I, you know, did all their packaging. But if I like hot pepper sauce myself, why don't I make my own hot pepper sauce and then give it the ultimate branding and then promote that rather than just being a creative? So I think I'm more pushing towards not just thinking of myself as a designer, but thinking of myself as a, a business person that is also a designer that does other stuff as well. I don't want to say entrepreneur because that was kind of sensitive in terms of, I don't really know what that means because there's a lot of people calling themselves that and we don't really know what they do. But mm. I'm a businessman slash entrepreneur that also does design. But the thought of it is I want to position myself as you're talking to the main guy, not a, a designer. So we're both running business. So when I meet you, you're, I'm meeting you as you running your business and you're meeting me as me running my business. Not just as a designer that doesn't know anything, doesn't know how to do the books, doesn't know how to promote market or manage people. With that all said, I've got Hollywood and which that's my main studio. And I've also got something called the, the Design Times, which was a kind of like a community that I'm trying to build. It's got a, it's predominantly a blog and an Instagram where it's just news basically because. I know there's a lot of design blogs out there, but I kind of thought, you know, some of them don't really say the, the news that I want to hear or I've got to search five different ones. So I thought, why don't I just throw all the kind of news that I want to hear onto my blog and maybe someone else might, it might, out there might want to hear it as well. So I've been building that for about six months, just trying to build a community through that, basically. And I've also got another brand that I'm trying to... Well, it's not really a brand, it's kind of an alter ego. So Hollingsworth and is more my professional output where I do work with a few other people like photographers and motion designers. But then there's also an exhibition that I do once a year with my older cousin and there's about six of us all together. So I'm part of a art collective called the Expressive Collective and we've been doing it for about three, four years now where we just put on an exhibition every year and people come and buy art. So there I'm a digital artist along with sculptors and fine artists, painters, illustrators, doodlers, photographers, and there's, there's a bunch of creative people that do a bunch of creative stuff and we just put in a nice show every year. So over there, I use the moniker of the BKH and that's like a separate artist alter ego. Then at Hollinsworth and I'm a designer and then I have the design time. So these are the kind of the brands that I manage and put forth to the world. Do you find that it's difficult to keep up with all of that? I mean, I remember you mentioned the BKH from when we did the interview back in, in 2014, but you're doing the BKH, yeah. you're doing Hollingsworth and you're doing, doing the design times. How do you balance all of those brands like that? Okay, so the Hollingsworth ad is pretty much full time. So what I've kind of done is kind of put all the brands on the Hollingsworth ad. So it's like Hollingsworth and I manage these brands on this kind of like a alphabet and Google set up and, you know, GV Venture. So, you know, I don't know if you know how they set up, but Alphabet has Google under it and they've got blah, blah, blah under it. So Hollingsworth adds kind of like a, I wanted, I wanted it to be like kind of like a holding company for these other brands that I manage rather than having them all separate. They're all separate, but they're all under that one family. In terms of balance and time, Hollingsworth adds is the main, the bread and butter that I kind of focus on every day. Because sometimes I was heavily doing it, but I could, it kind of took over and I kind of, I couldn't really balance it because, you know, writing a blog and Instagram and it takes a lot of time and, you know, putting out there and promoting it and blah, blah, blah. It takes quite a lot of time. So I've kind of cut back a lot, a lot on uh, the design time. So I kind of blog once a week now just to kind of manage it. 
until it kind of gets to a place where more people are involved or, you know, I'm getting more feedback and blah, blah, blah. But in terms of the BKH, which is kind of tied closely to the Spaces Collective, so because I'm working with other people, I don't get to, I don't have to do a lot of the work. So the BKH is just something that I've actually recently kind of revived. So I've just kind of separated it, basically. So it was always there. I just kind of never really promoted it. Mm-hmm. But we've just been having meetings in terms of the Spaces Collective and stuff that we want to do and get done. So I've just kind of revived it as, you know, that's me personally, because that's obviously, you don't want to mix all of the ad with personal things. So that's me as the brand, the artist, personally, you know, you know, put out prints and do shows and so on and so forth. Whereas Hollowsworth and his brand professionally at Design Times is just, Design Times is more like a hobby. It's just something that I wanted to do. I'm not really looking to make money off it or whatever. It's just something that, you know, I want to go to a place where I can find more resources and all the design news. So that's for me. But I just thought I'd make it public. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay. I want to go a little bit, a little bit deeper here because I know we're kind of talking a lot about your work. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. To you, what does it kind of mean to be a designer today? Because with what you've mentioned so far, aside from you doing branding work, you're doing your own projects, you're doing your friends' projects, you're part of this kind of art collective. collective. Yeah. What does it mean to you to be a designer today? <laughs> That's a very good question. I, think of, I don't think I've ever stopped to think about it. As you can, as you can see, I'm, I'm uh, always moving at 150 miles per hour, even when I'm speaking. <laughs> what does it mean? I think, I don't know what it means. I think I, I have an idea what I think it should mean, if, if, if you would allow me to remix your question. Sure. What I think it should mean, I think, and I think I learned this from the music industry, in terms of people just kind of taking the power. So, for instance, I think in my, in my mind, designers have a lot of power or any creative has a lot of power because you're creating something. So that means you've either made something from nothing or combined something from the lack of resources or from the abundance of resources. So you're quite powerful in my mind because not a lot of people can do that. So you see what other people don't see through the cracks and crevices through, you know, from nothingness. So in my mind, you have the power to create, hence why I, I like to create my own brands. So I think what I've learned from the music industry is that you, since you have the power, like it's essentially a free market on, on the internet now because anyone can jump on it and anyone can download a program and anyone can promote themselves. So I think what creatives are lacking, which I do meet a lot of people, that they don't know how to do those things. So they don't know how, they don't know how to send their own website. They don't know how to promote themselves on Facebook and boost their page or promote themselves on Instagram and boost their page or connect to people from Twitter. So I think what designers should be is they need... Designing is easy because you're creative and that's what you do, you create. But I think you need to have the business sense. I mean, I'm not saying be the best businessman, but you need to have that sense of business because design is what you do. That kind of thing, that's, that's very easy to you. That, that's perfectly fine. That you don't need to... Do, to just develop that, so to speak, because it's naturally coming to you. So I think for designers, they need to jump on the business. Are you charging the right price? Are you working the most efficient? Like, how do you work? And I think it just comes from clarity, just knowing yourself, I think. So I think it's kind of take the power back. And it's not just about creating, it's about business as well, for people to take you, you know, more seriously. I think I'd, in terms of the music business, I kind of learned that from people like Jay-Z, who he couldn't get sign and he just kind of took the power back to himself and said you know what I'm not, I, no one's going to sign me so I'm going to sell my own CDs and make my own company and put my own stuff out there and it wasn't as much of a free market as it is now when he was doing it you know the whole big thing in the music industry is now like everyone's independent you don't need no labels I'm kind of doing my own stuff blah 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 which I think designers need to adopt that mentality of going hard for yourself but yeah, in terms of design itself, well, that's just the background stuff. <laughs> I kind of took your, your question somewhere else. But in terms, in terms of what I think design is and what design should be, it's always going to be about solving problems, I guess, and serving people. I think it's a, obviously it's a service industry, but you can also serve yourself. That's why I'm always talking about creating my own brand. I don't know. I guess it's about thinking and serving. Okay. As long as you can think and create, and that's something that serves somebody. That's you know, people just have, oh, you know, you just do stuff that makes it look pretty. No, it's not really. It's about serving and it's about galvanizing. You're going to make, you know, galvanizing, you're going to make someone pick up that book, pick up that DVD, pick up that T-shirt, pick up that game, that game cover that you designed. Mm. It's all about galvanizing. So, yeah, it looks pretty, but the fact that it looks pretty forced you to look at it twice, five times, three times, share it, talk about it to your friend, or even go and buy it because it galvanized you. 
So it's always going to be about galvanization. If your design doesn't galvanize, then what does it do? Right. You know, women put on makeup to get a reaction, right? So yeah, it just makes them look pretty, but it gets them the reaction. So that's the same thing with designers. If you're if you're claiming that it just is here to make you look pretty, then why did it get a reaction from you? But I guess that's what I've got. So it sounds like, and you know, trust me, I understand as someone who has done their own brands. I mean, Revision Paths is something that I built yeah. kind of from the ground up. I didn't do this as yeah, a, a contracted project or or anything like that. And yeah, I do think more designers, I think especially black designers or designers of color or designers that are in underrepresented groups need to build their own projects. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Because one it lets other people kind of see what you can build and what you can create that's outside of, I don't want to say mainstream, but outside of the box of, say, advertising or working for a company. Like, what can you create if you have yeah. no no sort of creative limitation? No, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's it's important to, to do it from that aspect. But also it's important because it helps to build your skills up. It helps you discover skills that, you know, you didn't know that you had. And it can also bring in, yeah. you know, support from other people if – they look at what you're doing and they like what you're doing. They may want to help out. Yeah. The thing is, as well, it's like, for instance, it's like design isn't the only thing that you like. For instance, uh, and I spoke about Pepper earlier. There's this Pepper brand down here called Encona. I put it on every piece of food I can I, I ever eat. And everyone's like, you really like Pepper that much? I'm like, yeah, I really do for some reason. I probably can't taste anything because I've had so much Pepper now. But I'm thinking, <laughs> I like <pepper. laughs> if I like Pepper so much, why don't I make my own you know, experiment myself and make my own pepper and, you know, brand my own pepper and see if I can, you know, sell it to the market or whatever. Why? Why not? If I like it so much, you know what I mean? There's this um, nail salon that just kind of opened up on the high street and it was so well designed. I mean, I don't do my nails, but I looked at it and I was like, wow, so well designed. And I just I, I looked at the, the company website and it was an actual graphic designer who kind of she's the CEO of this nail salon who's got you know opened up in a few different locations mm-hmm. and I was like okay that's that's amazing because she's a graphic designer but she's got her own you know nail brand that's well designed but it's got nothing this nail's got to do with graphic design nothing really but she's she's a businesswoman that owns a nail salon but is also mm-hmm. a graphic designer but she's still very good so you, you can be both and I think it kind of goes back to people that I kind of look up to like Jay-Z he's a very good businessman but he's a very good rapper as well you, you, you can't take either of them away from him or people like um, Bill Gates who's a he, he, well I'm not sure if he is now but he was a, one of the top coders back in the day but he's also a very good businessman same with kind of like Mark Zuckerberg top coder but top businessman and I think I like that whole you know you have skill and craft but you also have business acumen yeah so you're, you're very strong in both I think that's just kind of that's what I'm trying to push in terms of mindset for creators, because I've seen a lot of talented people just doing themselves wrong in terms of, you know, you're so talented, but you're not getting what you deserve in terms of visibility and even money. So, yeah, and it really gets to me. I wouldn't say I'm, the, I'm not a millionaire, but, <laughs> you know, that, that that's always a thought at the back of my mind. Let's talk a little bit about creative insecurity, because I think that that's kind of at the root of what you, you sort of have mentioned yeah, yeah. earlier. Is there yeah. anything that you regret not doing because of fear? And the reason I ask this, aside uh, from just kind of the general motif of what we've talked about, is to yeah. take it back to 2014, when we were originally going to do this interview, I wanted to to do it as a podcast. Yeah. And that was because I think it was right around February 2014, I launched the podcast kind of officially in March 2014. And you were, I think you had said you were kind of scared of your own voice in a way. Are there things in your creative career that you regret kind of not doing because of that insecurity? I think the only thing I probably regret not doing, if anything, earlier was just kind of putting myself out there. You know, you you always kind of start out and like, oh, you know, I don't like my work or it's not good enough. And I think most people do that unless you're just completely, you love yourself a lot, whatever. But I think, yeah, I think if anything, just not putting myself out there or promoting myself or putting myself up because when you're a creator... You're creating all the time. Do you know what I mean? You're always on your computer. You're always putting that stuff. But then, you know, there's that little voice in your head that tells you that, you know, it's, it's a piece of rubbish or, it's, it's, you know, no one's going to like it or no one's going to see it. And so I think just for me, it's, it was more or less not being bold enough earlier enough. So I'm, I'm thinking yeah, I'm quite a bold person, but in terms of when it comes to work, I did have a lot of insecurity for a lot of years. And, you know, 
even until I kind of put stuff out and people were like, you know, started liking it, you know, you get the metrics of the numbers and blah, 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 even though you don't really do it for that. But I think if anything, it was just kind of that. But yeah, that's, that's, I wouldn't say I regret a lot of things, but in terms of my creative career, I just should have put myself out there a long time ago, I think. Has that changed that over helped. the years? Yeah, because uh, I do a lot of projects and most of them I do try and throw on my Facebook page or my portfolio or yeah, or my, my Instagram. I guess now I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I guess I think I'm better. So I'm just more confident in terms of, yeah, I think this is good. I'm putting this out. Mm-hmm. You see, you know, get the feedback and you know, you get a bit of feedback. Yeah. Do you think that you're but satisfied creatively? i satisfied. I will never be satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why I'm doing a community-based blog. I'm doing a expressive collective with the art exhibition. And I'm doing my professional, you know, so I can be you know, three different people, I guess, if in that sense. So I, you know, so because Hollisworth and is, is quite professional, if I wanted, you know, create a piece of art, you know, I wouldn't put it up there because it wouldn't fit in that brand. You know what I mean? It's like uh, McDonald's selling KFC chicken. It, it doesn't make sense. So if McDonald's wants to sell chicken, they've got to make a whole other brand and call it something else so it can fit in that. Right. In that sense. You know what I mean? So like, I'm more than one person, like, you know, Brian of it. You know, he are, he likes you know, to do random illustrative stuff for the BKH and he puts that up through Expressive Collective and that's his channel to do that. Brian Nova, he likes to deal with government contracts, subcontractors and, you know, professional work and do logos. And then Brian over there likes to hear about what's happening in the uh, design sphere and wants to know what other creatives are doing and, you know, promote other people's work. So there's like, there's, there's three different me's. <laughs> And I just kind of flow through that. So in terms of for me to be satisfied, so I guess. So now, were, keep, were, kind of it keeps me busy. Yeah. Now, as as a designer, were you kind of always this way? Like, did you always have this kind of kind of multifarious look at at different projects and ways that you could do different things, or is this something that kind of has come about in recent years? If I'm very honest, clarity's only come in the last two years. So. Like I said, I've been designing since I was about 16 and, you know, well, I'm 27 now. So, you know, I think for me, I think I'm pretty self-aware. So, but in terms of giving yourself that clarity is very important. I think for anybody, like be honest with yourself, you know, lie to other people if you want. But if you're not honest to yourself, then everything falls apart like a, you know, house of cards. So I think, so like, like I said, design times is only about six to eight months old. The BKH, I've literally started that last week so it's always kind of I mean I started it before but I kind of changed it because BKH was the studio name before but now it's just me personally and Hollandsworth and is the studio so I've kind of because I've gotten a bit more clarity on life and with myself I've kind of rejigged everything and separated it in what, it's, in what it should be and you know this is bright here this is bright this is bright there so I think yeah I think the word clarity is very important in terms of I know who I am I know who I want to be when I'm here I know who I am when I you know go to work I know who I am when I'm with my friends I know who I am when I'm with my family mm-hmm. so because we're all different in all these places. So I think, yeah, the clarity has just kind of made everything clear for me, I guess. And it's helped me a lot. So, What is it that keeps you motivated? Like, where do you pull strength from? Man, I'm a very, the thing is with me, I'm very energetic, so I'm very hyper. I'm probably going to listen to this, back to this interview and I'm talking 100 miles per hour for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> But in terms of motivation, in terms of motivation, ah, I just I just want to create things, man. I just want to do, as you can see, I'm juggling like how many things. I'm juggling, you know, this one's brand. I'm juggling my own brands and, you know, doing all these other stuff. I just, I just, for the love, I just love the love of creating itself keeps me motivated. So I want to get up and like, okay, oh, I want to do a logo for, or a branding for a YouTube. And then tomorrow I might be doing a, a government mayoral campaign. And then the next day I might be doing, you know, hot pepper sauce. Or the next time I might be doing a, a challenge or I might be, you know, doing a piece of art. So I think the fact that there will always be something to design or something to create or something to, you know, try or challenge myself with keeps me motivated and kind of gets me up. Because, like, if I was just doing, let's say, T-shirt designs all day, that would get very tedious for me and very boring. In terms of probably external motivation, I listen to a lot of Gary V. <laughs> I don't know if you know him. Yeah, Gary V. He's, um, yeah. he's like a... Yeah, Gary Vee, I love that guy. So I listen to a lot of him and a few other people on YouTube with their name and lose me right now. But in terms of just, and I'm, I think I'm just like him. I don't want to spend money on nice watches or fancy shoes, cars or clothes. I just love it because I love it. 
and that's what's, what's what kept me going. I just I just love the the fact that I can always create something new. I can always meet a new client. I could always do something for myself. And I think that's just kind of what motivates me. So I'm I'm pretty energetic. But yeah. So have you had any mentors or anyone that have have uh, kind of helped you out along the years? I haven't really, you know. To be honest, I really haven't had a, a design mentor, so I've made a lot of mistakes of just figuring it out by myself. So I can I can write a book about what not to do. If I'm honest. I've tried it all. I've tried if you name it. I've probably tried it because I haven't had a you know design mentor to say, oh you know try this or try that. I'm just literally every day just kind of work. I get myself out and find out about myself and find out about how to play this game and how to get the jobs and blah blah blah. I wish I did kind of have a mentor if I'm honest. I don't really know how to reach out to one or anything like that, but. I'm open to it. Just never had one. Oh, well, just reach out yeah. to them. You reach out. You ask. I mean, that's <laughs> that's kind of the easiest yeah. way to do it. Honestly, like if there's someone's <laughs> work that you admire, like reach out, tell them why you admire their work, and that's that's how it happens, really. Fair enough. Fair enough. I probably should actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look into it. <laughs> so for for Hollingsworth but, yeah. and what are the next steps of growth for you? Where do you want to be? Like say maybe uh, you the uh, next because I know it's only a year old right now and so yeah. we're we're forecasting. Let's say this is 2017, yeah. it's 2021. It's five years from now. Yeah. Where do you see Hollingsworth and in the future? I kind of want to grow it into like a proper big studio. Right now I'm just working from home, uh, which suits me obviously because I can just kind of roll over and roll into my desk and <laughs> get the work done. But there's a, there's a few friends that I am working with, so they kind of, if I get, you know, photography work, I'll subcontract it to them, but it kind of goes through my brand, so I kind of art direct slash manage it through. But in terms of five years where I want it to be, just probably me and my friends or, you know, guys that I'm really close with and cool with, just getting a lot of big projects and hiring other designers and working on just good projects, which is probably the most generic answer you, you probably hear from everybody. <laughs> But I guess that's all we can do is kind of just make our own brands and help other people with their brands, I guess. But I want to kind of move not just from design, but also into consulting and strategy. Because since we work, I know you do that at lunch, but since we work with a lot of um, brands, you see a lot of different kind of people, a lot of brands, a lot of business come through your doors for designing. So you kind of, from you getting to know their brands, you kind of understand their sector or their industry and you know how to kind of promote so to speak, or, you know, you can, you can come up with a strategy if you're, if you're wired that way anyway, which I think I am and you can cope with them. And then if you get more people in that industry or sector that are probably starting up or have been there for so and so years, you can kind of give people that advice. So I, I kind of want to veer towards strategy and consulting a bit more as well as, you know, designing and expanding the, the creative. So I don't do photography myself, but I would like to kind of offer that and same with motion design as well. So I think just, in a nutshell, expanding the creative to different disciplines, i.e. photography and motion, whilst also expanding the services to strategy and consulting, whilst also working on amazing projects of our own and of, for our people as well. What do you think you would have been if you weren't a designer? Oh, man. I think I would have been a musician. <laughs> but okay. I can't sing or play an instrument or anything like that. But I love music because I think music keeps me going every day. And the reason why I, I probably, I think I might have a little bit of synthesis. I don't know. It's kind of self-diagnosed. So, you know, <laughs> but, but every time I'm working, I have to have music in my ears and it just helps me kind of create. Just kind of, I just kind of see colors, I guess. And music is consistent as well. That's, that's the reason why I love it. Because, you know, you know, someone might love you today and hate you tomorrow, but music's it's written it's written in stone it's every time you put on a track it's always the same and it always gives you that same energy and takes you to that same place so it always keeps me going so i think if i wasn't designer, i probably would have i'd force myself to be a singer or a rapper or a or an instrument just for the music i guess but that's a, a very big pipe dream <laughs> have you thought about doing a project around music no you know that's a good idea i do kind of serve my cousin He's uh, who I do the expressive collecting. He's also an artist. He plays a little bit of guitar and sings. So I do his CD covers and his, his covers and all that, but it hasn't gone, hasn't gone further than that, actually. But maybe I should try and connect with like a band or something. I, I never really thought of that. But yeah. Yeah, you should, you should look into it. There's a, should. There's a designer. Uh, his name is Frank William Miller Jr. Uh, he goes professionally by FWMJ. 
And he does a okay. lot of album covers, design work. He has a website that's called Rappers I Know. Oh, okay. And when you go there, you can see all of the like album covers and things that he's designed over the years. I don't know if that's how he sort of got his start as a designer. Yeah. I know that's how I first found out about him because he's been doing it for for years now. But yeah, that's a. I mean, if you really like music, yeah. you like design, yeah. that could be a Merge. that could be something right there. Merge the two, yeah. Sweet, I'll look into it. Well, just to you know, kind of wrap things up here. Where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? My main site for Hollisworth and is hollisworthand.co.uk. You can catch me on Instagram and Twitter at holly, H-O-L-L-I, underscore, and. For the design times, it's simply the design times.co.uk as well. Expressive Collective and expressivecollective.co.uk, which is the brand that kind of manages my artist section. But if you go to those ones, you, every link that you possibly need, I'm not going to link, you know, everything, I'm not going to say everything, but you'll find every kind of possible link that links me to anywhere and anything on those sites. So, yeah. All right. Sounds good. Well, Brian Hollingsworth, thank you for for coming on the show. I know that, you know, we've talked before. I mean, not talk, talk, but we've had an interview before, which again was your 2014 interview. And I'm glad that you wanted to come back on because it's been good for me to see kind of where you were and where you are now. Certainly, I think that in those, you know, three years since then, you've grown in terms of the output of your work. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, a little bit earlier about clarity and how it's it's been important for you now that as you've gotten older that you're starting to get that that clarity around your business and what it is that you're doing. So I think even with these you know, three different brands and you've got this, this, uh, you know, this art that you're doing on the side and all this sort of stuff, you know, I think people are going to hear a lot more from you in the next few years. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited to see where you're going to be in the near future. So again, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thoughts of love are in your mind. And that's it for this week. Big thanks to Brian Hollingsworth and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Brian and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Also, thanks as always to our sponsors, Facebook Design, MailChimp, Hover, and SiteGround. Facebook invests in design. They care deeply about how their design team might do their best work, and that manifests itself in a number of different ways, such as showing how internal design critiques work at Facebook, sharing resources about VR and other cutting-edge tech, and by giving away great tools and resources like Origami Studio, popular device templates, and even diverse hands for mock-ups. Learn more about Facebook design at facebook.com forward slash design. More than 15 million businesses around the world use MailChimp to grow sales and to make money in their sleep. MailChimp has really grown from being just an email service provider to becoming your one-stop place for marketing your business. So aside from sending email, it ties into hundreds of other services like Hootsuite for social media management, Facebook if you want to do Facebook ads, Salesforce for a CRM, Eventbrite if you're selling tickets for an event, and a lot of popular e-commerce platforms. Get everything you need all in one place and sign up for a free account today. MailChimp. Send better email. Hover takes all the hassle and confusion out of buying and managing your domains. With free private domain registration and your choice of domains across all the 400 plus domain extensions out there, how can you turn that down? Go to hover.com forward slash revision path and get 10% off your first purchase. Since 2004, SiteGround has been empowering web professionals and beginners alike to build better, faster, safer websites easily without having to worry about hosting. Visit siteground.com forward slash revision path to get 60% off on all their hosting plans. SiteGround, web hosting crafted with care. This episode was edited by RJ Basilio and produced by me, Maurice Cherry. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. If you liked this episode, please do me a huge favor. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. It only takes a minute or two. It really, really, really helps the show by bumping us up in the rankings there for Design Podcasts. And I'll even read your review right here on the show. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Visit us at yepitslunch.com for all your design strategy and creative consulting needs. And if you like the work that we're doing here with Revision Path, then please consider becoming a monthly patron. You know, now more than ever, Revision Path needs your support. 
to make sure that stories about black designers and creatives in our field are being told in their own words. So if you support us, if you support them, just go to patreon.com forward slash provision path and pledge today. Pledge level start at just $1 a month and you'll get access to behind the scenes information about the show, upcoming interviews, and so much more. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time.